I didn't watch uh, Star Trek, uh, the original series, in the first season before I was on. I mean, I took one look at the styrofoam rocks and I said, forget it, I'm not gonna watch this. Klingon horda drach, ah! Means, can you speak Klingon? You have to give the right answer, otherwise there's dire consequences. I dance at powwows and I'm into the Indian way of life and things, and, and I'm also a trekker. It's the greatest feeling in the world, and I do it about 30 to 35 to 40 times a year to walk out on stage and to feel that love that just pours right out at you. And it's just fans. I've been a fan, I grew up with it, you know, so I couldn't help but be a fan. <laughs> this is the Andorian ambassador, Ed Vark, and I am guard number, 20, uh, number 48, and this is guard number 28. That's right. You have to understand that, that uh, even now, I still have I still have an ongoing process of trying to grasp all of this, even now. Uh, name's Douglas Marks. I'm in I live in Portland. I've been a fan of Star Trek for a number of years. I mean, I actually started watching it uh, back in the '60s. You know, I've been in this for seven years now, and it's starting to become normal. In 1987, I auditioned for a show called Star Trek The Next Generation. Now, I must admit that I went to this audition with some hesitation. I mean, after all, it was a rehash of a cult status sci-fi series. And it had a profound effect on the original cast members' careers. But since I was unknown, unemployed, and unclear as to where any of this was headed, I went. What I didn't know was that I was becoming part of something much larger than just a new TV series. I was becoming part of a phenomenon. My name is John Paladin. The Klingon name is Kurg. I'm Harmander Pau from Glasgow, Scotland. My name is, um, is, who am I? You're I'm, Lieutenant Commander. I'm Lieutenant Commander Horatio, and, um, from the, Starship. from the Starship Battle Queen. My name's David Silverman. I'm from central New Jersey, Canton, Ohio. San Diego. Virginia. Melbourne, Australia. Biloxi, Mississippi. Berlin, Germany. I have fans that write me from Germany, from Italy, from Australia, from England. I've been to conventions in all those places. How many conventions have you been to? Probably close to 50 or 60. Really? Yeah. I mean, like, like I said, you got to have something to do. This is my third convention. We've been to probably 20 or 30 20 or more. Or I lost count, you know. I've been doing this since 1969, so it's, uh, I almost hate to admit, this is my 366th convention this weekend. I have attended, uh, over the course of about eight years, 28 conventions. I'm going to be spending this day in preparation to go to the Pasadena Star Trek Babylon 5 convention. I'm going right now to pick up my new tailor-made Star Trek first contact uniform to wear tomorrow. Hey, Travis. Hey, Gabriel. How you doing? Come on in. Uh, so Linda dropped it off? Uh, yes, she did. This is the uniform to be featured in Star Trek First Contact. Linda Thuringer, our club's captain and Garrick impersonator, Billy. 
outdid herself here, except I do have a couple minor quibbles, like uh, the red stripe here. In the actual movie, it's going to be about half this thickness, but she can change that easily. And the lines running across here are more prominent in the actual versions, but then again, she can just do some top stitching there. She wanted to take the legs down a bit. I don't see why. But overall, fantastic. This is going to be your car, Gabriel? Uh, I hope so, because I'm um, 14, I'll be 15 in June. Another year after that, I'll be getting my license. It's the Roddenberry. I wish you could fly. I'm ready to go to another planet, I'll tell you that much. Obviously, someone never grew out of the 1960s. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in vans, that's for sure. We're going to put a laser beam on the front, so when we're driving on a foggy day, we can shoot like a 1,000-foot beam. <laughs> My name is Lieutenant Commander Barbara Adams. I'm commanding officer of the USS Artemis, which is the Little Rock unit of the Federation Alliance. I'm here at the sci-fi convention in Boston where uh, Federation Alliance has uh, brought some of our things up here. I've come because a lot of people have shown a lot of interest in what I did in uh, going to the trial in my uniform. I was selected, uh, summoned for the jury for uh, the Whitewater trial in Little Rock, Arkansas. We've had a lot of curious people asking about the organization and also uh, looking into my drawings, uh, which I do as sort of a hobby. I uh, study graphic design and I enjoy drawing, uh, and I also enjoy drawing the uh, Star Trek people. One of our charters in the Federation Alliance is to perform community service. And as commanding officer, I'm the role model for my crew. And so I felt it was necessary and a good decision for me to wear my uniform. For more than a week, everybody's seen the picture of Barbara Adams. And each morning, there seemed to be more and more reporters because they were waiting to see if I was going to come in my uniform. And it got to the point where it was just a wall of cameras, tripods, reporters, and I would literally have to walk all the way around them just to get to the door because they would not move. It just got ridiculous. My brother had a picture of her on our refrigerator for two months walking out of the courtroom in uh, Arkansas. And one of the newspapers had reported that every day I would walk past the reporters with a Vulcan-like stoicism. Wow. So <laughs> they don't know how close they actually hit the mark, because usually, before all this brewed up, I would always come to these conventions and our appearances as a Vulcan. And there was a bus driver that I already met. He kept asking me, what are you going to do? Why do you keep wearing the uniform? What are you going to do if the president comes down to testify? And I said, I'll wear my uniform. He said, but it's the president of the United States. I wear my uniform. We were, came to a stoplight. He turned around and he looked at me. He said, you are a brave woman. Every day, I wear my communicator badge, my rank pips, and my tricorder. To me, as being an officer in the Federation Alliance 24 hours a day, even when I'm not in uniform, I still want that known, that I'm at heart a Starfleet officer. I used to read about her in the newspaper, and I saw her, and I got her autograph. Basically, the philosophy behind Star Trek that she is so it, um, promoting is the philosophy behind an honest juror. That's what you need on a juror, is an open-minded person. Based on the ideals of Star Trek, yeah, I think she'd be an asset. This is what she wants to do. This is America. I mean, we should be able to do what we want to do. You know, look how we want to look, say what we want to say. I think she's a pretty neat lady to have the guts to um, kind of be herself, even on an important thing like being a juror. You can put on a uniform for football year-round, nobody cares. Basketball year-round, nobody cares. Put on a Star Trek uniform, people get a case of the giggles. I don't want my officers to ever feel ashamed to wear their uniform. And so I went to a civic duty. What we do is community service. I was performing my civic duty. I wore my uniform just as any other officer in the military would wear theirs. I came to meet the stars. I think see a different side of the stars, the personal side. While I was in Florida, Ruth Ann presented me with this belt buckle on my 138th birthday. <laughs> well, now, now then everything, every, every time I see someone, they say, you know, you look so much younger in person. <laughs> the first one that I did, um, I think was around 72. Um, I got a call to come to New York. They had done one convention 
first, and I think the, it wasn't really a convention. They got together with about 35 or 40 or 50, the way I heard this, this story, of fans of Star Trek that just wanted to get together and talk about the show, which they did. And they said, you know, why don't we put our money together and rent a hotel ballroom? And talk about our mutual interests and show each other what we have collected so far in the way of tapes or paraphernalia or photographs. If we could get 300 people to attend, we could, we could pay for it. And I thought, they're inviting me to New York? They're, they said they're willing to pay expenses and, you know, fly me there and put me up in a hotel. I thought, these people are foolish. And uh, there was something like, I think there were around three or 4,000 people showed up. And it was absolutely wild then. They had to call the fire department into the hotel to let them in in increments. Everything came to a dead stop. It was, it was jam-packed with humanity. The revolving doors couldn't revolve. The escalators refused to, to operate anymore. The elevators stopped working. And the din out there were, indicated there was more than 30 people. The woman went on stage and introduced me, and I stepped out, and the place exploded floated in applause. And then they were hanging out of the balcony. It was like a, a bunch of overage Beatles for us, you know, of me being there. There was hardly a chance to speak because every word created a roar. Every time somebody opened their mouth to say hello, it created a roar, a wall of emotional sound hit you. And we were all kind of taken aback and, um, and, and moved and touched by it because it was this tremendous affection, this tremendous affection and now there is a Star Trek convention. There are Star Trek conventions somewhere every weekend all over the world. Hi. Hi there. Could I have a schedule, please? Ah, Angel, definitely got to sing. She's Major. on stage right now. She's on stage now? Oh. What time is the auction? I don't, I don't see it here. Oh, there it is. Okay, this was worn by John Colicos in which episode? Blood Oath. Blood Oath. And this is the, uh, the turtle, as they call it. Michael Dorn calls it the great turtle. Turtle head. There's um, speed bumps. Uh, there's Whoopi Goldberg says old intestine head and um, the other one I heard is uh, Rocky Mountains that's a that's the latest one here is the opening bid for this $500 $500 we've got a $500 bid and it's there to a Klingon five fifty six 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 hundred six six hundred do I hear six fifty Six fifty. One thousand dollars. One thousand dollars. Eleven hundred dollars. Twelve hundred. What? Twelve hundred? Yeah. Twelve hundred. Okay, twelve hundred dollars. Twelve hundred dollars. Thirteen hundred dollars. Fourteen. Fourteen hundred dollars. Going once. $1,400, going twice, $1,400 sold in a volume. I was bidding on the headpiece, and um, it, the price started getting up to the point where I really wasn't interested in paying that much. That Klingon wa really wanted he it. He really wanted that headpiece, yes. So how badly did you want it? I, I wouldn't have left without it. It's a little bit of history that I'll preserve. I collect the items when I can get them, and they're wonderful to have. It's, uh, they're definitely one-of-a-kind items. Everything we touch, whether it be a little piece of hair or a nose or something small, there's a whole cult market out there where a lot of the pieces sell 
for hundreds and thousands of dollars. What we see in these rooms is literally could be, could run into the millions if there was, you know, if we opened up a market on the outside of it. So we're very guarded to everything we keep under lock and key. Unfortunately, John Delancey couldn't make it to, to the show this weekend due to professional commitments. We do have an autograph here. I'm looking for a Well, the Q-Vi was, was, was the most bizarre thing. John Delancey, who plays Q, was, was he barely made it to the convention. He was really sick. I mean, very ill, dizzy, questioned whether he was going to go on stage, but he's a real trooper. And he, he went up on stage and, and did a show, and, and um, you know, he, he left his water glass and uh, held up the glass, and I said, who would be interested in purchasing the Q virus? And it was kind of a joke, but the crowd just went absolutely crazy. They went, they went bonkers for the thing. So, I, you know, I went ahead and, and, and auctioned off the glass, and it went for... I don't know, forty, sixty dollars or something like this, and a, a, a guy bought it, and he, he came up, to and I said, "Look, it was half full still." Well, I said, "Look, you really, you don't want to drink this. He's very sick. I mean, he's very, very ill." He, oh no, no, oh no, I want to drink it. I want to drink. And he just he downed the whole glass right there, and he yelled out, "I've got the Q virus! I've got the Q virus!" And he plans to spread it all over the world. You know, that was his <laughs> his thing. I was walking down the street in New York, and I caught somebody coming towards me. He said, are you Q? I said, yeah. Can you bring people back from the dead? And I went, uh, only people I like. He goes, cool, and walked on. There was a fan who, in 1973 in New York, came up to Jimmy Doohan, who I was with, and pulled out a box that had a hypodermic in it and asked Jimmy if he could get a sample of his blood. A woman uh, stood up in one of the conventions and said, uh, what's it feel like to be beamed? 20 years later, he was at a convention in New York, and the same young man came up to him with the same box with the same hypodermic and said, Mr. Duhan, can I get a sample of your blood? He was still doing the same thing 20 years later. There's one gentleman who, for about, ten, what, 10 years? Almost the whole run of, of, since the beginning of The Next Generation, has been sending something in the mail every day to Star Trek. Every day. The funny thing is, it has nothing to do with Star Trek. He sends us travel brochures. Um, and that's all he sends. And postcards talking about where he travels. Where he travels, or sometimes he describes... Well, look at this one. We've got a Victoria's Secret catalog that he sent something about a mission, a, f a fruit, trees, and landscaping catalog. Caribbean, Hawaii, Canada, Australia. He also will sometimes send postcards talking about what he had for lunch that day, or what he ate, or how many cups of coffee he drank. And it's always to Star Trek, but it's never about Star Trek. And we always wondered about this guy. Where, who is he? Where is he from? And why is he sending us these things? And if you, over 10 years every day, that's quite a few packages. All right, go please. Yeah, you can see. Exactly. Okay, here we go, please. Rolling. Order. And action, please. <clears throat> Maybe you didn't read the crew roster, but my name is Dax, and I'm the new science officer. I'm this garbage scow, and you were in my seat. <clears throat> and cut. Very nice. There was a young man who was confined to a wheelchair. And his name was Jordan LaForge. The young man was given six months to a year to live. And uh, he attributes the fact that he lived for many years after his prognosis to the fact that he watched Star Trek. Finally, uh, when he did pass away, Gene just thought that uh, having uh, somebody in, in that place, you know, as Jordy, would be a perfect uh, example, a perfect sort of... A, a nice thing to do in memory of him. Originally, Geordi was the pilot of the ship, so he wanted the pilot to be, you know, the blind man, and the blind man is the one that's flying the ship. I watched the original series with my mother and brother when I was a kid, and I enjoyed it. Um, at this point, I enjoy his enthusiasm more. I enjoy the shows. I enjoy the conventions. I like dressing up. I love dressing her up. But I enjoy his fanaticism. It's contagious. 
and what makes you a fanatic as opposed to a fan? I think the fact that I'm so much into it, I do a lot of collecting, I relate to so much of it, uh, I know a lot about it. It's more than just a casual, I enjoy the show, I enjoy the concept, it's, I'm really into it. This is the Trek room. This is, you know, my room. I can design it the way I want. I can put what I want in it. Although you do notice it's spilling out into the other areas of the house. Yes. <laughs> this is the bathroom, and we've carried the Trek theme in here. Have our Starfleet towel set. And all of our Federation blue tile here, we offset it with these three hand-painted Trek tiles. The planets, the Enterprise, and one of the enemy. We asked whether we might visit Cape Canaveral, uh, Nichelle and I, and we peered in one of the portholes, and there were astronauts working in that. They uh, turned around and looked, and they recognized our two faces peering in at them, and you should have seen their eyes light up, and they came scrambling out of that place, and the first thing they did was, can we uh, ask was ask us can we have your autographs please we went there to get their autographs and they in turn were asking us for ours star trek came along at a time when i think the public was really kind of hungry for that sort of adventure and it went a long ways toward uh, stimulating a lot of interest into the space program star trek is a cultural icon and it's part of the lexicon now as a psychotherapist i have Star Trek stuff in my office, and I use Star Trek metaphors uh, that everyone understands, even if they're not a fan. Uh, for example, when I talk about people having a defensive reaction, I talk about the shields going up. And everyone knows what that means, even if they're not a fan. The front part of my office, that is the part that the patients see, is pretty straightforward surgical office. My own private consulting room is just filled with Star Trek stuff. I'm Dennis Borgenon. This is my son, Doug, my wife, Shelley and my daughter, Kayla. We're here in Orlando, Florida, the dental offices of Dr. Dennis Borgenon. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you. Good, Good to see you. you. Welcome to Starbase Dental. We originally decided that we wanted to go with Star Trek because we find that Star Trek, the episodes are always geared with a moral. They're good doers. And we wanted to portray dentistry, uh, dentistry or dentists as good doers. So, um, this is reception? Yes, this is reception. This is where the patients check in. This is our holodeck over here on the left. This is uh, where I do most of my work. It's where I get fillings, crowns, dentures, things like that. We were just in a sci-fi store one day, Shelly and I, and we kind of looked at each other and we said, Hey, you thinking you what thinking I'm thinking? I'm thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and we said, let's try it. Two weeks later, we just closed down the office over the weekend, and we bought up everything we could find, and, and boom, we, we did a star-based dental. You can see our transporter is up in the ceiling over here. Transport you away from here while, uh, while we're working on you. These are some nice pieces over here. These are my uh, cement handprints of some of the stars. They're about James Doohan size. No, oh, wait. There's, He's a, missing there's a finger, a finger yep. missing. <laughs> he has one missing. A gardening yeah, I accident. I never knew that. <laughs> This, this is the first theme office I worked in. I really like it. It's neat. It's fun to come to work. Yeah, it's yeah. different to come to work. You don't know what's uh, what's going to be around every, <laughs> every you morning. Every morning you come different in, in all the time. Every yeah. morning you come in, you wonder, well, what's going to be on these walls that wasn't here before? The uniform I wouldn't do at first. I told him no, <laughs> that wasn't possible for me. And you but, just how long did it, did you hold out? Uh, about almost a year. Almost a year before I was I was the last one to put it on. What made you finally turn the corner? <laughs> he told me I had to. <laughs> <laughs> she cried a few times. And he said, told oh, me oh, I had well. to. We actually dress up like this at home, and we take turns being different characters, and it helps our, our um, relationship. Our... Yeah. Yeah, it does. I was going out with different people. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. I haven't done you yet because I'm not tall enough, so he usually puts a wig on. He has to portray you, and then I have to be Data or Cork. Yeah, Cork. <laughs> Sometimes Cork. <laughs> <laughs> and how do the patients respond? Most of them like it. I think the Star Trek theme in the dentist office is great. Um, it just it takes your mind off where you really are. It's not like any other dentist office I've ever been in, that's for sure. Most people, even if they don't like Star Trek, like the idea of it. I've only had one person who uh, didn't like the idea, but he wasn't happy about his bill in the first place, so... <laughs> 
Good afternoon, Preston. How you doing? Hey, Dennis. How are you? Good to see you. Come on back. Let's go ahead and get you going here. Okay. We're going to take a look here. Number two, the clues are lingual. Number three, crown. Shelly and I started in another office at about the same time, and Shelly started as the front desk receptionist. And after about a while, she liked uh, dentistry so much, she would have decided she wanted to maybe assist, so I brought her back, and I taught her to assist. And uh, we worked very well together, so we decided to make it a bond for life, and we're together now forever. I'm dressed as a NASA astronaut that was actually killed, that they investigated the death of. Uh, in an episode called The Royale of The Next Generation. Um, at least that was the original idea. And then I kind of moved on. <laughs> kind of character developed it <laughs> a little bit. Um, instead of it being him, it's his wife. <laughs> so what is your interest in, uh, in Star Trek? Mainly Brent. Brent Spiner, Lieutenant Commander Data on The Next Generation, as you well know. Yes, I know him well. <laughs> Now, you guys call yourself... Spiner Femmes. Spiner Femmes. Yes. Spiner Femmes? Uh-huh. I like that. It's good, isn't Spiner it? Spiner Femmes. Yeah. I think there's a series in that. <laughs> this is my Brent page. When I find out that somebody else has discovered Brent through my web page, I feel really good about it. I feel, yeah, it's another fan here. Let other people outside of the Star Trek universe know who he is. He's not just Data. This is where I keep... Right down here, I keep... All the important collectibles got the videos t-shirts mugs the important stuff if there's an earthquake a fire i want this stuff to be intact this is my photo album and these are more convention photos and more convention photos and even more convention photos and <laughs> it goes on for days knowing i these ones i always put them in so they're all facing the same order once i get through with these then it switches to the ones this way saves having to turn the photo album every two minutes. Uh, Palm Springs convention. This is actually, I took over 100 pictures at the Palm Springs convention, and when I got them back, I took a picture of all the pictures I took. A lot of these are enlargements of convention photos. I had a calendar made up one year for a couple of friends for Christmas presents. That's my back right there. I gave him, it was a Texas stamp they issued, and they issued a sheet that told the back background of Texas and all that. I ordered it from the post office and framed it for him since he's from Texas. I don't get much stuff anymore because I've sort of let it be known when I've done conventions and stuff that it wasn't necessary and it wasn't really a good idea because of the, the, the people should be spending their money on me, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I tried to express that, that we do okay, you know, and that they should really, you know, save their money. It's not about the money. It gives me a good feeling. It's, I, I, I like to do that for my friends, too. If I can find something unusual, I'm just, I like to get unusual gifts for people. After I lived here about a year and I found out where Brent lived, and I realized I could just see, I can't see his house, but I can see the hill, the top of the hill that he lives at the bottom of from the balcony. And so when I'm stressed out, I come out here sometimes, just sit out here for a few minutes and take what I call a Brent break and just kind of gaze off in that day, direction and daydream for a little while. What are some of your favorite things that you well, like to do at conventions? Ever heard of filking? No, tell me what that is. Science fiction folk singing. It, could you explain that? Well, actually, I could give you an example. Perfect. Um, episode uh, of original series called Space Seed, which was the launching for the second movie, The Wrath of Khan. There is a song. Um, the song is called Vow of Vengeance. It's Khan's Vow. That's, I see. The summer sunlight, the howling at night, the blood of friends spilled on the sand. A mitzen quick death, she breathes her last breath and dies as I cling to her hand. Mere mortals you be, the truth you can see. You think you have right and you, I mean, it's been a while since I've signed. You think it, that. Action! An alliance with the Borg? More like an exchange. If we teach the Borg how to modify their own nanoprobes, they'd have a blueprint to create a weapon to fight the aliens. Cut! When I am asked to go to a hospital, it's a specific boy. And he's not going to be there the next time I go to that hospital. 
And it means a great deal to him that I be honest with him in that hour that we share together, you know? That can change your life. There's a woman who was almost totally paralyzed, and she was able to just kind of, with the help of an interpreter, say, for the hour that you are on, meaning Star Trek is on, I forget the body that I am imprisoned in. I got a fan letter from a young lady. It was a suicide note. So I, uh, I called her. I said, hey, this is Jimmy doing. Scotty of Star Trek. I said, I'm doing a convention in Indianapolis. I want to see you there. I saw her. Boy, I'm telling you, I couldn't believe what I saw. That was, it was definitely suicide. You know, somebody had to help her somehow. You know, and obviously she wasn't going to the right people. You know. Anyhow, I said to her, I said, I'm doing a convention two weeks from now in St. Louis. And two weeks from then, in, the, in something, you know, and then eventually she also came to New York. She was able to afford to go to these places and everything else. So, uh, and then that went on for two or three years, maybe 18 times. And all I did was talk positive things to her. And then, then all of a sudden, nothing. I didn't hear anything. And I had no idea what was happening to her because I, I really never saved her uh, address, right? Eight years later, I get a letter saying, I do want to thank you so much for what you did for me because I just got my de master's degree in electronic engineering. You know, I, that's, to me, the best thing I've ever done in my life. And it brings tears to my eyes every time I even talk about the story. Over a period of several years, we've raised several hundred thousand dollars for these three charities. This is what Star Trek does. Star Trek is part entertainment and part philosophy, and uh, this part of Star Trek goes unnoticed to most of the public. I have a question. Have you thought about actually talking to school teachers? I'm a school teacher, and talking to schools and getting them to talk to the kids about it. Can you help us lunch? organize that? Sure. I teach kindergarten, so sometimes it's a little hard for them to grasp the concept of racial diversity and ethnic diversity. So if you have a show like Star Trek that shows a bunch of different aliens and a bunch of different colored people and different types of people all getting along, it, it works wonderfully to illustrate that point. Star Trek has changed the way that I teach science, specifically space science, by giving children uh, an immediate frame of reference that they know of, that they can get excited about, it just inspires their imagination. This is something we've been excited about because it's carried on. Having Kate Mulgrew portray the captain on the Voyager. They feel that it's the first time that they can sit down as a family and view a woman in a leadership role as a family without uh, having to carry on a conversation about who's being victimized or what does she stand for. She is so obviously a woman of authority and strength, but she's not a witch with a capital B. You know, she's, she's just... A person in authority. I get a great deal of mail from women who say that they watch Voyager with their daughters and how good it makes them feel to be able to point to the screen and say, see, you can be anything. And what do you want to do when you grow up? Be an astronaut. May Carol Jemison, first African-American woman in space. She flew on the shuttle, became a scientist first and then an astronaut because she saw Nichelle Nichols on the original Star Trek series and said, you know what, that's for me. There were two little girls, around nine years old, eight years old, when Star Trek first came on. And one of them told me years later, I looked on that television and I saw you, I saw this black lady and I ran through the house screaming, come quick, come quick. There's a black lady on television and she ain't no maid. <laughs> and she said, I knew right then and there, 
I could be anybody I wanted to be. I could be anything I wanted to be. And so she decided to be a superstar. <laughs> and her name is Whoopi Goldberg. I'm Joyce Mason. And I'm Evelyn DiBiase. And we host a radio show called Talk Trek and Beyond. Mm -hmm. The way it got started was we were on a lunch hour one time at work, and we thought about Trek, talking Trek. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, something we do a lot of. <laughs> so we decided it would be a great radio show. How do you do it? Well, I called up uh, the directory assistants on the phone, and I asked for the telephone number of, of a radio, radio station. station. <laughs> and she asked me... Which one do you want? I didn't know, so I said, pick one. Anything. And she did. She picked out uh, this radio station, KAV. We packed up our things, went over. Two weeks later, we were on the air. First uh, time? It was seven years ago. And, and we're, we're still, still on. on. The air. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we didn't have the we foggiest were. idea what we were doing that first night, but, and we still don't. <laughs> a convention on the air. Good evening, gentle beings. How are we all doing tonight? Welcome to Talk Trek and Beyond. This is Joyce. We're delighted to be with you. We're going to have a good time tonight. We have a very special guest with us. Yes. Denise Crosby. Denise Crosby! Yay! Guys, are you ready? Mm -hmm. I know that our listeners are just dying to talk to you. Hey, John, in Portland, Oregon, on line one. Hey, Portland. Yes, hi, you guys. Wow. Good, how are you? Hi, Denise. Hi, John. One thing I'd like to say that without Skin of Evil, there could have been no yesterday's Enterprise. Right, exactly. There's some irony in that, isn't there? Yes. I mean, I always felt that I, I had to die and get off the show to get the best episode. <laughs> <laughs> I love this, being able to talk to you like this, because when the show originally aired, my father passed away. Mm. I'm and sorry. the weird thing about it was the friends that were there, a lot of them were Trek fans and mm -hmm. were around me at the time. And we sat down and watched that episode. The strangest thing about it was by the time it got to the end and the holographic message and the whole thing, it actually helped me a great deal. And here I get to thank you personally, which uh, I did appreciate it. I still do. John, I'm, I'm really touched. I think so many times that um, people don't realize just how important. Uh, a show can be it can destroy you or it can as in a case like this give you a tremendous amount of comfort oh yes between the ending and the the holographic imaging and the the clouds and everything it was just exactly what i needed at the time john i don't know how to say thank you for that yeah. tonight oh, mm, yeah. you know for sharing that with I us i thank you for talk trek you're, thank welcome. You, you're welcome thank you for being with us thank my you, friend john. There's nothing like a bunch of Trek people getting together someplace and just sitting and talking. They'll go for 24 hours or more. And, and that's why it's called Talk Trek rather than Trek Talk, because it's not just a matter of uh, talking about Trek, but rather it's a whole universe within itself. Mm -hmm. Just like people talk French and talk German, we talk Trek. So what does your bathtub look like at the end of the day? It looks very green. <laughs> Trust me on that. <laughs> Who is your favorite captain? Ah, have to be uh, Captain Kirk. Captain Picard. Oh, I'm kind of a Kirk fan. I like Kirk because he was the first captain. The original, the prototype for everything else that came along afterwards. Absolutely, Kirk. Captain Sean Luke Picard. 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 Now, there's a very handsome man. That's a very handsome man, Captain Picard. Who's your favorite captain? Data. Well, Data's not a captain. No, I don't like any captain. Who's going to be Captain Kirk? Come on. Come on. He's a stud. I could almost say Janeway. Janeway's a stud too, but... <laughs> Janeway. Janeway. I'd probably say split between Janeway and Kirk. Kirk. I like Avery Brooks too. But that's because he's cute. Who's your favorite captain? <laughs> I am. I couldn't pick one captain over another. The emissary. The emissary. The emissary is the most Probably important. The emissary. He's most important. But to place the others above the emissary would not be right. When I got the job, everybody said, oh, the Trekkers, the Trekkies, well, you... well, in fact, they're very smart. One has to be smart to connect science with the imagination. That's what's really interesting to me, that, that, that a show could have fans that span and bridge every sort of classification. Stephen Hawking and Mel Brooks and... Uh... You know, Dr. Marvin Minsky, who's head of the robotics department at MIT, or uh, the Mercury astronauts. Accountants, these are lawyers, these are people who just really, really enjoy the program. There's this preconceived notion that they are a, a peculiar bunch of people, you know. Uh, I don't think I've ever met anyone 
Star Trek fan or not who wasn't peculiar. I mean, we're all peculiar, aren't we? The word fan actually is an abbreviated form of fanatic. Um, and there are some people who fit that category, who are the people who really do need to get a life. Um, but most fans are pretty normal people uh, who have a hobby, who have a, a sense of the desire to escape. And, uh, you know, they know it's a show and you know, nobody really gets lost in it, but it's, it's just fun. We are the largest ship in the San Diego area. We do a lot of community service. We go and visit abused children in hospitals, and um, we work fairs, and we're having a miniature golf tournament in two weeks. And Dressed as Klingons? Yes. You play miniature golf dressed as Klingons? Yes. Yes, we're, we're um, going to donate the money to charity. My name is Marco Krend, and what I've done is develop the Klingon language for Star Trek. Our only greeting translates quite literally to what do you want. When they played Klingon softball, I never devised words for, you know, you're out, you're safe, something like that. So they had to improvise. The way they improvise is, you're dead, you're alive, which works just as well. I like the way uh, Klingons believe, the code of ethics and honor. What I've done is turn around tattooed. Klingon insignia it took me about two and a half hours of work with a homemade pen to get it inked in. This is a Klingon disruptor pistol. Two basic settings. This is the stun. That's the stun setting. Never have I heard it been used in Star Trek. Not only has Klingon been spoken just in the movies, it turns out that people like to speak the language. People like to learn the language. The Klingon language camp is something that we've been. Uh, uh, having for the last four years. It's a summer program for people to learn the language and the uh, customs of the culture. Klingon Holt. Klingon Holt. Klingon Holt the Jack Ah! Klingon Holt the Jack Ah! Maj. How do you say kill? Hoch! 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 Ye 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 hoch! Ma hoch! Ma hoch! Poi pupe pu pu ma poi a poi e shui she ma shu me u ma shu ma lo e ma cho chu a she ve qua cho pa pa. They just came out with the first full edition in Klingon of Hamlet. They're working on translating the Bible. There's a, a team of scholars doing this, and they've translated the theme song to Sesame Street, the theme song to Gilligan's Island. Klingons are really popular. Klingons are very popular. It's an interesting <laughs> phenomenon. I mean... And it... you said that with a straight face. Klingons are popular because they're fun. Uh, Klingons allow us as, as non-Klingons to, to express a certain aspect of our personality, I think, that we're, that, we, that we're not allowed to do in public. I want to get the um, sour creams and chives potato. Can I cheese on a superstar or without? Without cheese? This combo? Okay. Would you like the super side for 39 cents? More is got to large fries and our drink. Have you ever served a Klingon before? Yes. You've served Klingons before? Yes. 